Well, good morning again. And that's right, we're continuing with the series, Choosing Truth. And last week I spoke about how, truth, how important truth is and do we need truth in our lives. And I think we discovered that truth is important and we do need truth in our lives. As I said last week, truth will bring us to a, a point of stability and it also brings us to a place of correction in many areas of our lives. Many of us struggle with uncertainty and we struggle with doubt and we, we struggle with indecision, but truth guides us back to, to, a, to a place of uh, solidity in our life. Without truth, it won't matter which road or direction we take because we don't have a true destination. We haven't set a true destination of where we want our lives to be. And if there's no set destination, then how will we know when we've arrived there? Without truth, we'll always feel the discomfort and the dissatisfaction in life, a feeling of disconnection and, and being lost and that's not a good feeling for us to have as Christians. How many of you have ever been lost in your life before? Really lost. I, I don't mean spiritually lost because we've all been there. And I don't mean the kind that you lost your car in Walmart's parking lot during Black Friday. Not that kind of lost. I'm talking about really lost in the forest where you don't know how to get out. You don't know what direction to go to. That kind of lost. The kind of surviving nature kind of loss. Okay, now we are. Oh, you've been there. Okay, good. You know, I remember uh, being a part of our May Day program when I attended Paul High School. And um, my friends and I were chosen to uh, be the Kaili bearers. And we needed to, to get some lays for the, the program. So we decide that we don't want to burden our parents and uh, we make a decision to go out and go into the forest and go get Miley. And if you don't know what Miley is, it's a long um, uh, vine-like plant that you could, it's, it's very sweet and you, you kind of take it off the stem and then string it together and then we make nice beautiful lays out of that. It's really, really sweet. Well, anyway, my friends and I, venture right after school going to the, the forest and um, this is my first time ever picking Miley but my friend said eh, you know I, I went with my parents I, I went before so let's go you know so I trust these guys you know I trust them with my life so we went out we went up to the rainforest we started going into the forest and about half an hour later I'm walking with them going up and down the terrain it's wet, it's, uh, you know, it's just damp in there and we're getting tired and half an hour later, there's no Miley. And then one hour, we, we've been walking around for an hour and we finally hit this patch of Miley. I mean, like there's Miley everywhere. So my friend comes to me and says, okay, this is what the plant looks like and this is what you do. You, you kind of peel the bark back a little bit, you string it around and then you just strip it. And then it'll come all into a, a small little thing and then you just put it in the bag. I said, cool. So we're stoked walking around in this patch of Miley just going crazy. And I'm thinking, wow, plenty of Miley. We hit the jackpot because Miley is expensive. Many of you have bought, uh, brought Miley before, right? And it's expensive. So I knew this. So we pick a lot of Miley and I'm thinking, wow, we're going to be rich. So we gather together, and we're happy, we're, we're looking at all this money, we got more than we needed, and we're stoked about that, and then my friend, reality just hits us. 
My friend looks around and says, anybody know where we came in from? My jaws drop and I'm realizing, wow, we lost. The Miley means nothing to me anymore. Nobody bought one compass. This is my first time and experience picking Miley. I'm hoping that these guys, they know what they're doing. They know this stuff. So we're walking around in this forest. You know, it's thick. There's, there's a lot of trees. There's a lot of staghorn. I'm hungry. Nobody bought food. Nobody bought water. I'm frustrated. I'm tired. And now I worried. So we're walking around. One hour later, we finally find a way out from the forest and we come in on and oh, relief. Then my friend turns to me and he tells me, yeah, bro, you scared, eh? <laughs> you sweat, you bet your sweet bread I was scared. Picking my lid and getting lost is not funny. And losing track of truth in our lives makes us feel as though we're lost and we're not able to find our way back anymore. That's a frightening thought as a Christian. We can easily lose track of truth when we're focused on wealth or greed or selfish motives. What the world sees as worth or what the media says that we need in our lives. My friends and I were ecstatic that we'd get to go and pick Miley ourselves and not depending on our parents to buy the lace. We thought it was a fantastic idea, but we didn't think things through very well. I can imagine if my parents knew that, that I was going into this forest to pick Miley. They would probably forbid me from doing it because they'd be thinking of my safety and probably they'd consider the dangers of going into a forest and picking Miley. We need to think true, true. Last week I said that truths, the truths of God's word is able to protect us and warn us of the difficult times as a believer when it happens in our lives. If, many, if my friends and I knew the dangers of picking Miley, it might have changed our minds at that time. And for many of us, there's a lot of, a, there's a lot of times that we know the dangers of life. We know the truths of God. God's word which, which protects us. But we just want to be independent of him. And we want to do things on our, on our own most of the times. We put aside the truths of God and look at what seems good. Or what we'll be able to gain. And we'll step out of the protection of God's truths. We'll step out once and we'll think, ah. I got away with it this time. It'll be okay. So we do it again. And we think it's okay. And we keep on doing it. Pretty soon we've wandered so far from truth that we've lost sight of it. And now we're lost. And we don't know how to get back. You see, knowing God's truths corrects us and directs us. But disobeying it will put us in a dangerous position. How many of you ever tried putting a frog in a pot of boiling water? Yeah. They say that if you boil water and you put a frog in it, as soon as you drop the frog in the boiling water, it senses danger because of the boiling water and it would, it would leap out of the pot. But if you was to put the frog in the pot and water while it's cool and slowly turn the heat up, the frog would remain there and eventually become soup. Yeah. Well, it's the same with truth. If we know the truth and the dangers appear, we'll recognize what is truth and we'll probably remove ourselves from the danger. But if we constantly refrain from the truths, pretty soon we'll become so comfortable in doing it, and our constant disobedience to truth will slowly creep up on us until we become soup and eventually die spiritually through our disobedience. We become lost. There was a time in the Old Testament era 
when the people of Judah and Jerusalem were in a similar situation where they wandered away from the truths of God. They were so disobedient that when God looked down from heaven, he couldn't find any truth and honesty among the people. There were the remnant, the few who were trying their best to live life, a life of righteousness. But being around these people just endangered them and in in, in falling into the disobedience of walking away from truth. That's when God sends Isaiah, the prophet, to these, to these people to speak to them and remind them of his truths and to show them a way back, a way back to truth, a way back to himself. Isaiah 59, 14 to 16 reads it this way. And here's what God saw, and it's in your notes. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whatever shuns evil, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieving, achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. So God sends Isaiah, and through Isaiah, God relates this promise and this truth that I'm about to read to the people. But I believe this promise is for you and I too today. It comes from Isaiah 59, 21, and here's what it says. Here's the truth. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants. From this time on and forever, says the Lord. What God was saying to this people, and he's saying it to us today, it will be by his spirit. It will be by his word that we'll find our way back to truth. He will place his truths in our mouths and upon our hearts for this generation and the generations to come. That's why the promises belong to us today. Because we're the next genera generation. We're the, the children who follow that generation. And he's also saying that we have a responsibility. The responsibility to teach these truths and these commandments to our children and their children. Listen, God's word contains the truths we're looking for. And choosing it is up to us. And that's why this series is called Choosing Truth. So how do we get back to truth? I want to look at a parable that Jesus taught his disciples and he's, he's going to teach us today. And it's the parable of the prodigal son. So if you got your Bibles, would you open your Bibles to the book of Luke? And we'll be in the 15th chapter. And if not, you can take out your notes from your bulletins, and then you can follow along with us this morning. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. We'll start from verse 11, and it's the parable of the prodigal son. And it reads, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. 
But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Here we have a classic example of disobedience and a child walking away from his father thinking that he can succeed on his own. In those times, it was considered a sin or, or dishonor to ask for your inheritance before your parent, your, your dad, or your parent passes away. And here, the son disrespects his father, actually cursing him by asking him for his inheritance. He sins against his father. Then he goes to a far country and squanders his inheritance on, on reckless living. This can be the same for us as we wander away from truth, disrespecting the Heavenly Father's words of truth. Our disobedience of truth carries us further and further away from, from the truth, from the Father. Pretty soon we're lost and we don't know how to get back. And like this young man, reality will begin to kick in. It'll kick into us and the truth finds its way to our hearts and starts to work within us. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. Here's your first point for today. How do I get back to the truth? By finding, number one, the truth about ourselves. The truth about ourselves. To get back to truth, we need to examine ourselves. Who we are. What's my identity? And what am I doing here? For many of us, we've wandered away from the truth. And to get back to it, we need to examine me. A lot of times, we, we want to examine the other person. What they're doing. Who are they? Why are they here? To me, it's just being the ele. You know, we don't need being the ele. We need to examine our own, ourself. What's the truth about myself? Who am I? And what am I doing here? That's what this young man does. He examines himself. And the parable tells us he came to himself. The NIV version says this. When he came to his senses, he realized he was lost. He needed to find his way and discover who he was again. Where he was and where did he go wrong? He takes his inventory and remembers what he had while he was with the Father, while he was in the truth, because the, God is truth. But he also realizes where he had positioned himself. He's in a distant land, far far away from the Father, far away from truth. Taking a thorough inventory of ourselves gives us a starting point to discover truth again. But it will start with knowing whom we are and acknowledging what we've done to be in this position of life. It will take a lot of humility on our part to just do this inventory. We have to face the truths about ourselves and we have to become transparent before the Almighty God. King David was a king who, who walked in humility and he examined himself often. And he says this in Psalms 139, verse 23. He says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Taking an inventory of us is a choice you and I get to make. I'm not going to stand up here at the pulpit and, and try to point out your shortcomings. 
I got my own to deal with. That's something you get to do on your own before the Lord. That's your personal inventory. It's between you and God. You take your inventory. No one needs to know your business. No one. Unless you want them to know. Unless you want help in doing your inventory. And that's where counseling comes in. But as pastors, we're not your judge. And we're not your redeemer. We can't fix you. We can't. We can only direct you to his truths and let the Lord change you because he's the only one that changes people. He's the one who will show you the truth about yourself. He will. We are just messengers delivering the message of truth and truth will find its way and it's going to start within us. Listen, if we can't be truthful with ourselves, then what makes you think you're going to accept God's truths? Because most of the time, his truths will reveal what's happening within us. And if we can't deal with the truths in our life, what makes you think that you can deal with the truths of life? Deal with it. Give it to God. And get rid of it. Get rid of the pain and get rid of the sorrow. Get rid of the doubt and the unbelief. Give it to God. In the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, who's believed to be the author, writes it this way. Let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. We'll be able to get back to truth when we accept the truth about ourselves first. It will always be hard for each and every one of us to accept what's wrong with us. But listen, if it's truth, then we need to accept it. That's why we need truth. That's why we need Jesus Christ. What truths is God asking you to examine? Maybe it's to do with your relationship or your marriage. And he's ex examining you of what you need to do in that relationship. It's not about your spouse. It's not about your partner. It's not about your children. It's not about your parents. It's about what he's doing within you and through you. Maybe you're in an addiction of some sort. And maybe it's not drugs. Maybe it's not alcohol. Maybe it's, it's food or, or whatever you're stuck in. Maybe you're in a financial situation and you need to examine what you need to do. What's the truth? I don't know what you do and you'll find it. Truth will find you. What is God asking you to examine in your situation of knowing what is truth in your life? What's he doing within you? The prodigal son examines himself and he discovers his mistakes and begins to find his way out of his mess. Look at what he says in verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The son examines himself and he found the truth of his mistakes. And yes, he did feel remorseful. He saw the truth of his sin and his lifestyle and knew he had to do something about his ways. It was through his examination of his disobedience that he experiences the pain and the sorrow of what he's done and it led him to repent. And that's your second feeling for this morning. To get back to the truth, we need to experience, number two, the truth of true repentance the truth of true repentance after taking a true inventory of ourselves we come to grips with ourselves sure we'll experience the sorrow of sin and disobedience but it's brought forth by the truths of God's word his spirit the sorrowful experiences will produce what I call 
true repentance. This is when our hearts repent, not our feelings. Some of us repent just to feel better. Just to feel better about ourselves. True repentance, folks, cleanses the heart. If you get anything today, get that. The true repentance cleanses the heart, the heart of the pain and the sorrow that sin produces within it. Whether you're a Christian or not, God has placed his spirit into every one of us. And inside of you and I, his spirit lives, the spirit of truth who guides us into all truth. When we begin to experience the sorrow of the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of understanding God's love and his mercy for you and I. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says it this way, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. In other words, it cleanses us. But worldly sorrow brings death. Well, some of us will be hard-headed and we try God. We actually test God. We'll give him the sins in our front pockets and most of you know what sins that are. That is, it's the easy ones that we can give him, the obvious sins. But we hold on to the ones that are in our back pockets, the critical sins, the sins that holds us bondage, the ones that we don't want him and others to know of, the ones we think that we can hide from God and keep it for ourselves, keep it to ourselves. No one knows. And we don't truly repent or submit our hearts to him. Folks, when we hold on to those things in our back pockets, I want to tell you right now, that don't work. Believe me, I tried it. That bother no work. True repentance requires total submission and if we don't truly repent listen we'll get lost again all over again because that's the lie that we didn't let go we'll wander from the truth and continue to do the same thing over and over again because we haven't truly repented of our sins and letting go of the pain we'll commit the same mistakes over and over again looking for a different result every time. Folks, that's not repentance. That's called insanity. But even, though our, even through our stubbornness, even through our disobedience, even if we resist his truths, the heart of God is to love us. And through his love, he'll be kind and gentle to find a way for us to get back to knowing what is the truth. 2 Timothy 2.25 states it this way. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. True repentance will help us make a 180 degree turn from where we were and start us on a new journey towards the knowledge of truth. God is looking for true repentance of our hearts. And that's what this young man did. He examined himself and truly repented of his heart. He got rid of the lies and, and the sorrows, the pain that, that held him down. He makes a choice to know the truth about himself. He makes a decision of his heart to return to what is truth and repent. Look at what he did in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The young man knew where he had to go. He knew where he could go. And he found his escape route and returned to the father. That's our last point for today. To get back to truth, we need to discover number three, the truth about the Father. The truth about the Father. 
in this parable, the father had every right to reject the son, the lies, the, the disrespect, and the greed the son showed the, fa the father, warranted him to shun this child. But he doesn't. As a matter of fact, he was waiting for the son to return. As soon as he sees the son, the father ran to him, filled with compassion, and greets him with hugs and kisses. Folks, it doesn't matter how far we venture away from truth. Truth will find us and is waiting for us to return. The truth is that no matter what we've done or think about ourselves, God loves you. And when we've examined and realized that things that separated us from, from him, separated us from the truth, and come with a heart to truly repent of self, of sin and disobedience, that's when truth happens. The truth is that there is a father waiting with open arms to welcome us home. He's ready to give us and gave us more than you could ever imagine. He's ready to give us a kingdom because truth has found its way into your hearts. We're no longer lost, but found true truth. Luke 15, 22 to 24, it states it this way. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robes and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatty calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Folks, you want to return to truth? Then return to the rock. Truth is found in Jesus Christ. He states it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we're lost and distant from truth, the truths of God, start examining yourself of who you are. Bring yourself to realize that everyone sins. Everyone sins. And we need true repentance of heart. Submitting to his word and his, his statutes and return to the truth. Return to the rock of our salvation. Jesus Christ. That's where we'll find true truths for our life. When we return to him. He is our rock. He is our salvation. He is truth. Return to the rock. Praise the Lord. Awesome, awesome job. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Christina. And I think you get the message already. To get back to truth, we got to go to the rock. Because the rock is, is solid. And it's truth. Here's the living testimony. It's Jesus Christ. The living testimony of the Father's word and truths. If there's anything in this world that would convince me of what's truth, it's found in the life of Jesus Christ. God's spoken word that became flesh to us. God's truths lay within Jesus Christ. We all commit mistakes. We all have sinned before God and, and disobeyed his word. But here's truth. God still reigns and he still remains in love with you and me. That's truth. That's the truth of the Father. We'll find true truth, true repentance, but we truly return to truth when we believe in the truth, in Jesus Christ. God didn't send Jesus to condemn us, folks. He didn't. He was sent to save us. And that's the truth of the Father's heart. John 3:16. And 17 reads this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then listen to this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. God knew that we'd be disobedient to his word. He knew our hearts and the deeds and the works that we do. He knew we'd venture away from his truths. 
So he sent us his son, Jesus, as a way to return back to him, to return back to what's truth. He proved that God's word is true to his life. We return to truth by hearing and believing it. And here's part of John 3 that we don't usually recite, but it speaks truth to us today. John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict, and he's saying this is the truth. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. The prodigal son shows us a way to return back to truth, shows us a way back to God by examining ourselves in truth, which begins to bring us to repentance, true repentance. Then we'll find the truth of the Father's love just waiting, waiting with open arms, ready to love us back into his kingdom, back home. Truth knows that we are loved by the Father. And truth knows that we are indeed in need to love one another. One relationship at a time, we get to do that. Truth lies in Jesus Christ. Amen? You may put away your Bibles and put away your notes. There was another character in the parable of the prodigal son, and it's the, the older son. And in those days, it was the responsibility of the older son to go out and bring back his younger brother. But the older son was disobedient because he didn't go out and go and gather his younger brother and bring him home. He sinned too. He fell away from what's truth. But he did find truth and forgiveness through the Father. And the Father told him very clearly. And he said these words to the older son. You will always be with me. This morning I want you to know that God will always be with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. But folks, people need to know that that's truth too. They need to know the love of the Father. In your bulletins, we have this Christmas cards and there's dates and times on it for the services and the plays that's coming up. And we've given that to you. We've placed it in your bulletins as a tool to invite your family and your friends to, to church. It's a tool that we get to use to, to bring our families, to bring our co-workers, to bring people to church because they need to know the truth about Jesus Christ. This season, I'd say take this card and be the older brother. Be the older sister to your family, to your friends and go out and invite them. Go get them and bring them home. Amen? Let's bow our hearts in prayer this morning. Most gracious Father, we thank you that that is truth, Lord God, that we have wandered away and we've wandered far from the truths of, of your word, Lord God, and your love. But it's so refreshing to know that, Lord, you still love us and that you would always make a way of escape for us, Lord God. Thank you for your son. 
thank you that he came and your word says that he came to fulfill fulfill the truth the truth of the scriptures the truth of your word father and it is in his life that we can find truth about ourselves Lord God as we examine ourselves Lord God give us the strength to accept Lord God the truths that that's that, that's breaking our hearts that that's giving us doubt and unbelief and putting us in situations that it's hard for us to live because we need truth Lord God so that we can set a destination for our life I would pray that through your spirit of examination Lord God to the power of your Holy Spirit that it would bring us to a true repentance father really submitting our hearts and our souls to you our hearts to you Lord God in true repentance that it, it would not just make us feel good about ourselves in doing it but it would cleanse us father of of what's there the pain and the sorrow that sin brings but it would release us into knowing your love for us Lord God and knowing the truth about your son Jesus Christ that it would draw our souls and our spirit back to him Lord God because that's where we want to be father we want to be in your presence so Lord today we thank you that in your word and through Jesus Christ we are more than overcomers not God and we can live life knowing the truth thank you for loving us in this way in Jesus name I pray and the congregation would say amen